Once a month, I spend an hour with Anne, my spiritual director. I wish more people knew about spiritual directors and had one. Maybe the best way to describe them is that they're like a friend of the soul. They are specially trained to pay attention to God's activity in your life and help you to strengthen and deepen your relationship with God. I've been working with Anne for more than 10 years now. We started meeting over Skype sometimes because of the horrendous traffic in the Bay Area. And since I moved to Columbus, I'm still able to see her over video call. Something I really appreciate about Anne is the way she prays for me at the end of each session. She never takes any kind of notes, but her closing prayers always touch on everything we talked about. My memory is not that great, and I've usually forgotten I've said most of this stuff. But Anne was listening. She remembers. And she weaves together all these different threads into this detailed picture that she offers to God. Through her prayers, I get to see myself maybe the way God sees me, fully seen, fully known, fully loved. We pray for specific people all the time in our liturgy. We may know that others are praying for us privately, either because we've asked someone to do that or they've let us know that they are. St. John's has a remarkable prayer group that prays faithfully every day for a long list of people who have asked for prayer. I've never known of a prayer group quite like it. But how often do we get to overhear someone praying for us? How often do we hear the truth of ourselves reflected back to God, someone's highest hopes and fondest dreams for us offered up to the Holy One? I'm guessing not nearly often enough. It's been a difficult night for the disciples in John's Gospel. Jesus has invited them to eat dinner together, one last meal before he is arrested. After supper, he washes the disciples' feet, taking the part of a slave. It's the closest the disciples have ever been to Jesus and to each other. Then Jesus tells the disciples that one of them will betray him, that Jesus himself is leaving them, and Peter, Jesus' closest friend, is about to deny him. The world the disciples have known is ending. Their shock and grief are profound. Jesus doesn't have much time left and he teaches the disciples everything they will need to go on without him. Three whole chapters of the gospel. And then Jesus prays for the disciples, right there in front of them. Jesus lets the disciples overhear his prayer for them. In some ways, that's not surprising. To be a disciple in John's gospel is to be in relationship with Jesus, to abide in Jesus as he abides in you. It's not so much doing as being. It's a more restful, mystical approach to following Jesus. That relationship with Jesus transforms the disciples. The lonely, vulnerable woman at the well is transformed into the center of a new community. Peter, who denies Jesus three times, is transformed into the feeder of Jesus' sheep, the one Jesus entrusts with leadership. Mary Magdalene's profound grief is transformed into abiding joy and purpose. Relationship with Jesus is everything for John. And one of the key markers of relationship for Christians is that we pray for people we are in relationship with. So, of course, Jesus prays for the disciples. It's what we do for each other. What is surprising is that Jesus prays for the disciples right in front of them. This section of John's Gospel is sometimes called the High Priestly Prayer. We always read from it on the seventh Sunday of Easter. Jesus begins by describing the disciples to God. He talks about his relationship with them, how he has made God's name known to these women and men, how they were a gift from God and they have been faithful to God's word. Who is Jesus, the word made flesh? Jesus shares this incredibly intimate relationship with God the Father. The Father is in the Son, and the Son is in the Father. Everyone who belongs to Jesus belongs to God, and everyone who belongs to God belongs to Jesus. It almost sounds like a marriage vow. And Jesus has brought the disciples into that intimate relationship. Because they are in relationship with the Son, they're also in relationship with the Father. And the disciples are in relationship with each other. Jesus prays that the disciples may be one as he and the Father are one. This unity goes beyond mere cooperation. It's an existential sharing of space. 
The disciples are already one, and they still have room to grow in unity. Jesus tells God who he knows the disciples to be. He bears witness about the disciples to God. They are fully seen, fully known, fully loved in Jesus' eyes, and they are fully seen, fully known, fully loved in God's eyes, too. It's been an emotionally intense night for the disciples, to say the least. They began with quiet awe and reverence as Jesus washed their feet. They move into shock and horror when he tells them he is leaving and they'll betray and deny him. As Jesus gives his farewell, the disciples know these might be the last words they ever hear from Jesus. They're desperate to listen and savor every moment. And then that prayer. The disciples must have felt such wonder and gratitude hearing it, even through their tearing grief. They must have known just how much they were fully seen, fully known, fully loved. And that seeing, knowing, and loving, that abiding in Jesus, Jesus praying for them then and still praying for them after he is gone, it carries the disciples through whatever comes next. Death cannot stop the disciples' relationship with Jesus. And that enables the disciples to carry out the work he has given them to do, to love others in Jesus' name, to bring new generations into relationship with him. This past week, the wardens, music director, chair of the worship committee, and I began outlining options for our worship in the coming weeks. The Diocese of Southern Ohio has issued new directions for in-person worship based on the recommendations of scientists and public health experts, and that's what guided our work. We will share these options with you soon. We need to hear what you would feel safe with and what you would attend before we can make a decision. It is clear that we will not be back to the pre-pandemic normal for a while, perhaps many months. Gathering in large groups is too risky, even with masks and social distancing. Singing appears to spread this particular virus very easily, so in-person worship would have to have instrumental music only. And there is no safe way to distribute the bread and wine of communion. Bishop Bridenthal has directed us not to celebrate the Eucharist yet. Our options are either morning prayer in person, with limited numbers of people, strict social distancing and mask wearing, and no singing, with the service streamed online for those who can't attend, or continuing morning prayer on YouTube like we have been doing. The things that make our liturgy meaningful and spiritually fulfilling for me are worshiping with many other Christians, singing together, and sharing the Eucharist. And I do not know when we will be able to do that again. I understand the disciples' grief and shock at the Last Supper at a whole new level. This is what it is like when your world falls apart. All this loss and change is hard to bear. There are two things keeping me going this week. One is a column in The Atlantic by Dave Grohl, the rock and roll drummer, founding member of Nirvana and Foo Fighters. Grohl lives for concerts, playing them, attending them. He actually uses religious language to describe the experience of singing along with a huge crowd. He says, we are instruments in a sonic cathedral, one that we build together night after night. And he's lost that. I was in tears reading his column because his grief is the same thing I'm feeling about worship. But he writes, I don't know when it will be safe to return to singing arm in arm at the top of our lungs, hearts racing, bodies moving, souls bursting with life. But I do know that we will do it again because we have to. It's not a choice. We're human. We need moments that reassure us that we are not alone, that we are understood, that we are imperfect, and most important, that we need each other. And I could say the same thing about worship. I don't know when it will be safe to worship like we used to, but we will, because we have to. It's who we are as human beings and as followers of Jesus. We will surely have concerts again, and we will surely all worship together and sing and share the Eucharist again. The other thing that is keeping me going is knowing that through all this, Jesus is praying for us. 
On that night long ago, Jesus prayed for all those who would come to know him because of the disciples. That means us. We may not be able to abide in Jesus through the Eucharist right now, but we abide in him and he abides in us through prayer. Jesus prays for us because we are in relationship with him. In his prayer, we are fully seen, fully known, fully loved, even in our shock and grief and loss and anger. Knowing someone is praying for me has given me the strength and discernment to get through many, many tough weeks and years and to do hard things I never thought I could do. We are praying for each other as we always do, and that is meet and right. And Jesus is praying for us. With Jesus praying for us, we will get through this. Prayer for Christians is a marker of relationship, and a relationship with Jesus transforms us. We don't yet know all the ways this pandemic will change us, but we can see how abiding in Jesus, being fully seen and known and loved, changes us, the way it transformed the woman at the well and Peter and Mary Magdalene. As Jesus prays for us, as we abide in him and he abides in us, we become more fully who God created us to be. And Jesus gives us what we need to do the work he has given us to do.